When technology reaches its limits, progress has two paths. The first is a radical step forward with the use of something revolutionary. The second is bringing the existing potential to perfection. The embodiment of the second path was a fast, long-range, high-altitude and formidable plane which boldly claimed the title of perfection. Was supposed to claim. Hello Aviator, Sky here, and today we're going to meet the first McDonnell aircraft, a unique and interesting aircraft. The aircraft that died while elevating its creators. The McDonnell XP-67 Moonbat. The 1930s were a period of searching for new ways to develop aviation. Gas turbine engines at the time were still far from real use, and engineers from all over the world were desperately looking for new ways to improve the piston aircraft that dominated at that time. War is the engine of progress, so when in 1939 World War II began, the military technology race began with it. The US jumped into the race quickly. The future was hazy, perhaps soon American fighters would need to escort bombers on long-range raids, perhaps they would have to combat fighters to conquer the skies, or perhaps they would have to defend America itself from attacks by enemy bombers. This option also had to be considered. Faced with such prospects in 1940, the US Army Air Corps, the predecessor of the Air Force, formed the technical task for the R-40C project, which involved the creation of a special fighter high speed, high altitude and long range to perform wide spectrum of tasks, primarily interception of enemy bombers. The task was very ambitious, the interceptor had to outperform any fighter of that time, and this task had to be approached creatively. It was a turbulent time, and creative people worked not only in famous companies but also in small firms, one of which was recently created by James McDonnell, obviously McDonnell Aircraft. It's funny. There was a time when this name didn't mean anything to anyone. The future parents of Skyhawks, Phantoms and Eagles were a small company mainly engaged in production of spare parts. And just like that, having received a request from the military, they decided to take on their first aircraft. Their Model 1 project had advanced aerodynamics and two pusher propellers rotated through a complex transmission by a single engine buried in the fuselage. Too exotic? The military thought so too. In addition to McDonnell, a couple dozen of other participants fought for the contract, and a small company with a design that raises questions was clearly not the favorite. However, the ambition of a fledgling aviation company was noted, and McDonnell still received limited funding to redesign the Model 1 into something more real. The Model 2 became more real, with even more developed aerodynamics and tractor propellers, now on two engines installed under the wing. Already not bad, but something nevertheless was missing. The aviators revised the design once more, developing the Model 2A in 1941, with engines integrated into the wing. There were less exotics, but no lack of ambition in the design. The aviators did everything to achieve the best aerodynamic performance, and the results of their work were immediately evident. The exotic appearance quickly gave the aircraft a nickname, Bat, or Moonbat. If Batman had a plane in the 1940s, this would definitely have been it. The McDonnell engineers expected that their solutions would provide speeds of up to 472 knots. Such speed for that time was crazy, and given that the aircraft had to have a mass of 8.5 to 9 tons, several times heavier than conventional fighters, it should have been very cool. In September 1941, the United States Army Air Force, as they were now called, finally gave the contract to McDonnell. For about $1.5 million, the aviators had to assemble several mock-ups for testing in labs and wing tunnels, such a design required serious study, as well as two prototypes for full-fledged flight tests. The aircraft received the index XP-67. So, the XP-67 Moonbat is an all-metal mid-wing monoplane with engines integrated into the wing itself. 44 feet long, 55 feet wingspan, 15 feet high. A fairly large machine for a single-seat fighter. Maximum weight just over 10 tons. 
They could boast of a heavyweight fighter, but originally smaller numbers were planned. The planes turned out to be pretty heavy, and it cost them dearly. A special feature of the Moonbat, and the reason for such an unusual appearance, was a deeply integrated design with a wing fuselage blending, in which all parts seem to flow into each other, providing the best airflow, and the entire airframe is flattened, forming a solid wing from tip to tip. Meanwhile, some of the airframe surfaces provided a laminar flow, which improved aerodynamics even more. Just a reminder, it was the 1940s. Engine nacelles divide each wing console into two parts, somewhat reminiscent of the layout of the SR-71. The inner part is, by and large, a continuation of the fuselage stretched from it to the engine. In the resulting volume, a weapons compartment was placed, and a lowered ventral flap was installed below. The outer part of the wing also had a smooth integral connection with the engine nacelle, but remained relatively classic. There are also large ailerons and trim tabs. The empennage of the aircraft is also familiar to its time, cruciform with a large stabilizer and fin. The landing gear is tricycle. The front leg was located in the nose fairing, and the legs of the main gear went into the niches of the engine nacelles. The single-seat cockpit under the large sliding canopy, to the delight of the pilot, was pressurized, which greatly increased comfort on long flights. The range was supposed to reach 2,070 miles, approximately 3,800 kilometers. Of course, it's not a fighter without weaponry. Several sets of weapons were offered for the bat. Six 12.7mm cannons, four 20mm cannons, and even 75mm. But almost a tank gun was considered an overkill. It was decided to put on the aircraft six 37mm M4 guns. One of the main innovations was the power plant. Attempts to bring the aircraft to perfection also concerned the engines. The race was for maximum power density, lightness and compactness. For the Americans, the mechanics from Continental went farther than the rest, creating the Hyper XI 1430 model, a 23.3 liter inverted V12 with a general electric turbocharger and liquid cooling. A bonus was the special exhaust system that blew hot gas out the back, creating a little extra thrust. For the XP-67, its main bonus over radial engines was its compactness, which made it possible to place the engine inside the nacelle with the best flow and smooth connection with cooling air intakes and the large four-blade propeller in front. The planned power output of the Moonbat was 1,350 horsepower, with a short-term maximum of 1,600. It should have been enough. Work on the project was in full swing, but its volume was great. Such aerodynamics required serious study, and McDonnell engaged in them along with several research centers, primarily NACA. Tests in the wind tunnels brought many surprises, both pleasant and not so much. The number of nuances was huge, and handling them took a lot of time and effort. With the power plant, things were even more difficult. The motor was, shall we say, not without issues. First, it was brand new, with all the initial problems. Secondly, radial engines are so popular for a reason. Their compact inline counterparts suffered from overheating, and the more power they had, the more difficult it was for them. And thirdly, let me remind you, World War II was still raging, and the engine builders had more important priorities than an experimental airplane. Continental struggled to find resources for the new engine, resulting in constant delays in deliveries and in the test program. The first XP-67 prototype was ready in December 1943. Well, by ready, I mean it was able to fly, but a significant amount of equipment was not on it yet, the cockpit was not pressurized, and weapons were not installed. The tests that began soon were quite difficult, even at the stage of pre-flight runs along the runway, due to the exhaust system failure, a fire broke out in the engine nacelles. The first flight of the XP-67 was made at the beginning of 1944, and it lasted 6 minutes. The plane had to land due to an engine malfunction. The aviators had to seriously modify some elements of the power plant, after which the plane was lifted into the air again, having completed a successful flight. Finally. It would seem that everything was good, but at the fourth time the problem returned. 
The engines reached extreme work speed, damaging the bearings. The flight had to be stopped again. The problem of the power plant was not only unreliability. As practice showed, the engines in normal mode gave out 1060 horsepower, while they were supposed to have 1350. Chronic power deficiency, coupled with the excessive weight of the aircraft, adversely affected flight performance, and no innovations in the field of aerodynamics could compensate for this. McDonnell, tormented by constant problems with engines, had already begun to look for alternatives from Allison and Rolls-Royce, even with the addition of boosters in the form of Westinghouse jet engines, capable of potentially reaching 500 knots of speed. But the military, also tormented by long-term development, did not support an even greater inflation of the budget, demanding that they go with what they have. In the spring of 1944, new engines came to a slightly upgraded aircraft and tests were resumed, now with the participation of Army pilots. The guests were delighted with the cockpit and the unusual appearance of the Moonbat, and the performance was not bad. The aircraft was comfortably controlled and had decent maneuverability. But not everything was great. Due to the lack of power, the heavy XP-67 had difficulty accelerating and gaining altitude, and the takeoff and landing required a distance that was not at all fighter-like. In addition, the plane was fond of the Dutch roll, the oscillations of the airframe in flight, and more critically, its stalling performance turned out to be not good. Moonbat at minimum speeds while maneuvering started falling on its tail, and this was with fairly simple tests. The problem was so obvious that they were afraid to conduct a full-fledged spin test. There was a high probability that the plane simply would not be able to get out of a spin. McDonnell put a lot of effort into perfecting their airframe, but the project was not killed by problems of aerodynamics. Engines remained the main problem, underpowered, terribly unreliable, and with eternal overheating troubles. The XP-67 managed to get to the cruising flight mode only once, accelerating to 405 knots, which of course was not bad, but far from those 472 knots that the aviators promised. The finale of this battle came in September 1944, when during another flight the aircraft had an engine failure again, and a fire started. The pilot managed to make an emergency landing, but all attempts to save the machine were unsuccessful, and the flames swallowed it. The prototype was lost, having flown only 43 hours. The second plane was still far from ready, and given all the problems, the loss of a single prototype was the last straw. The military reviewed the prospects of the program, and the conclusions were disappointing. The Hyper engine did not justify itself, and by the end of the war it was clear that the future was with jet engines. The integrated laminar flow airframe was clearly ahead of its time. The aviators still didn't really know how to handle it, and some of the problems of such design only became solvable years later with the introduction of new design methods and advanced flight automation. But what was done turned out to be insufficient. Being a complex and expensive aircraft, the Moonbat in the aggregate of its features really couldn't outperform its already serial counterparts. The conclusion was sad, but obvious. There was no point in continuing the work. The project was closed. But the failure of the first project for McDonnell Aircraft was not the failure of the company itself. In the process of work, the aviators showed themselves to be very serious guys. Already in the beginning of 1945, the McDonnell FH Phantom, a jet fighter, took off into the air, and then, in the following decades, many more of their birds conquered the sky, making the Creator Company one of the pillars of the aviation industry. This concludes our adventure today. Like and subscribe to the channel so as not to miss the continuation. And if you want to watch the videos early, see some exclusive behind-the-scenes content, or just support the channel, consider joining our Patreon community. Fast flights on beautiful and reliable aircraft, and soft landings to you.